So what is the lab? The lab is the Wildlife and Aquatic Veterinary Disease Laboratory. And what we do is we work with stakeholders throughout the state that are involved with aquatic and wildlife species, whether or not that be terrestrial wildlife like deer. Uh, we, we work with a lot of the deer farmers in, in the wild deer populations, FWC, the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And of course, the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission is not just the terrestrial side, they're also the aquatic side. So stranded dolphins, you know, big mass mortality events in fish, we receive those samples to try to help make a diagnosis on what's going on, whether or not it's dying deer, dying fish, or dying sea turtles. So we do a ton of sea turtle work as well. So it's primarily aquatic with a little bit of dabbling, again, as I said, into terrestrial species. But now as uh, we're infectious disease experts, we're actually doing quite a bit of work even on COVID. So um, it's actually a very one healthy kind of approach, you know, working with scientists, biologists, veterinarians, studying aquatic animals and the interface between aquatic animals and the terrestrial ecosystems. And as I'm sure many of you all are probably all of you know, ecotourism is a billion dollar industry in Florida. So making sure that we've got healthy fish populations, people come here to fish. It's one of the fishing capitals in the world making sure that we have sea turtles that can be watched nesting, bird watching, we do quite a bit of aquatic bird work, and of course our manatees, and all the reasons that people come here to make sure that our wildlife is healthy. The other aspect of what we do is making sure that we have healthy seafood, right? So we all love our shrimp and our clams and our oysters and, and all the various fin fish species and lobsters and so on and so on. We work on infectious diseases across aquatic species and even, even coral. So it's a diversity of things. It always keeps us on our toes. And the various technologies that we use for that are high-end sequencing technologies. And just, I, I think it's interesting to think of, of, of how science has progressed in, since, say, I, since let's just take it from, from my viewpoint in the last uh, 20 years that I've been in science, having done a master's degree and a PhD, and went to vet school. So in that 20 year span, and since I've been a professor here for about 10 years, the old techniques for doing, making diagnostics were very slow, meticulous, uh, um, expensive, and had a very high rate of, of failure. But now we've moved from, from technologies that, that, that do simply PCR to detect a pathogen in a sample, like a dying bird or a, a dying sea turtle and they might detect just one thing to now we just sequence the entire genome of the organism, so the sea turtle, plus everything else that's there, including all the bugs, the good bugs, the bad bugs, and sort through that. So we can rapidly actually now, in just a few days with our tabletop sequencers, it's kind of like Star Trek. You, you really grind up the tissues and you just pop it in the machine and it tells you everything else that, 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 that that's actually there. And that's a way, way simplification. It's, you know, it's a, I'm simplifying what we actually do and, and making it sound very easy. And it is a challenging thing, but it's to actually make the point that in the last 10 years, next generation sequencing technologies have made it possible to sequence full genomes and find pathogens rapidly. We can even do these technologies. They're like a USB, a thumb drive. You can actually have them connected so that you can simply plug it into your computer and, and sample on a boat where you see dying manatees or on a remote beach where you have a stranded whale or on a fish kill where there's no lab access or, or any power and energy. There's, this work is done in our laboratory, but it can be done in the field. And so technology has really allowed us to do things that kind of sound like Star Trek or Star Wars. And it's really, it's really an amazing time to be a scientist and such. So that's a general introduction to what we do here, which again is the Wildlife and Aquatic Veterinary Disease Lab. We find new pathogens that are affecting our aquaculture, agriculture, and our wildlife species in the state of Florida, and as, as well as around the country. And there's even that human component that I mentioned, the COVID-19 work. We've sequenced all of the COVID-19 strains that have been in Northern Florida that are being isolated here at Shands and at, at, at other local agencies as well. So, so that's a little bit about what we do. What I wanted to do next, if it's okay, Stephanie, is walk through the laboratory and show some of the equipment that I was actually referring to and uh, give a quick 
tour of the lab. And then I, I know this is, is, is a, uh, just a quick and dirty um, episode here. So, and then give people some, some time to ask questions. Will that work, Stephanie? That definitely work. Yes. In fact, I'm going to just ask everybody as things kind of come to mind, write them in the chat box and I'll be happy to throw some questions out your way. Okay, Tom? Sure. That and we'll do the tour and I'm, I'm very happy to, to have people chime in now or whenever they want to. So before we take the next step, there will be time again, hopefully in the next few minutes to ask questions. But does anybody have any questions right now before we do the virtual tour? Okay. Well, if not, we'll, we'll, we'll hold them and we'll, we'll go through the lab and I'm sure we'll have some questions at the end. But uh, yeah, so let's see how this goes. Sounds great. All right. Okay. So this is my dirty office. So this is the hallway essentially into our laboratory and samples actually start. Is that going okay? okay. Actually samples start in our laboratory here. And what you can appreciate hopefully here, could you show the biosafety cabinets here and here. We have to carefully, we have to carefully work with samples because wildlife samples, as many of you may know, the human pathogens that we're discovering now, things like COVID-19, are probably coming from wildlife, which is why it's always exciting to be studying wildlife. We've already, we already know all the human pathogens. It's only new pathogens like COVID-19 and other viruses that are being discovered coming from wildlife. So the future of finding human pathogens and diseases in wildlife are interlinked. So we have to make sure that when we work with samples, we're working in these biosafety cabinets, which are, Kudi's gonna walk you over to a biosafety cabinet. But what you can see is you're working in basically what looks like a fume hood that is protected against a human coming in contact with that sample. And so these rooms are under negative pressure, so that the air is sucked out and not reused before they're being filtered. And then the next step is after we process the sample is to do further processing on robots. So our people then transfer the samples that will process the sample all the way to the end of the line in robots. And there's a lot of equipment for doing, for doing that. This is... Uh, are one of our, our, our gadgets that can do all of the processing for high throughput to make sure if we have a lot of samples, we, we, don't, we don't stress our people out by handling it, our robot can handle it. So the processing is pretty much done with, uh, with here in, in the robot stage, and we move to our next room for doing diagnostics. And the next room here, the next room is for doing what we call PCR. And PCR is a very, very powerful tool for detecting pathogens in a sample in small quantities or even in high quantities. So any quantity allows, it allows it to be detected. So the sample was maybe the necropsy was done in the room that we showed before in a hood and then and it's extracted over there so that we can actually do a PCR in that robot that I showed you. And then the PCRs are set up and these are the machines for doing PCR. Again, PCR is a method for detecting pathogens in very, very small quantities. So let's say we have a, a virus COVID-19 in a human sample. We actually can use these machines to detect even small quantities say in a human sample. Or if it's a herpes virus in a sea turtle, we can use our thermocyclers here. And again, we might receive hundreds and hundreds of samples at a time. So we have robots, again, the Chi Agility could be shown here. The Chi Agility is another robot for doing automated processing of samples and helping us do lots and lots of samples for PCR. So this just shows the inner workings of the robot so that we don't, again, stress our people out and they do a little bit of the work and the robots are doing the heavy lifting. So that's a, that's a part of what we do here as well. So that would take us basically to the results of a sample is positive or negative for COVID-19. And then last but not least, we have another room at the end of the hall. I gotta walk slowly so you can keep up. 
this is where we find the results. And we have microscopes, of course, for looking at samples to see if they have parasites or bacteria. And, uh, uh, you know, that's just, that's just a, an important part of working with microbiology. But again, great microscopes. And we have hoods in this room to work in a sterile, healthy environment for our people. And of course, viruses have to be grown. So we have all of our incubators, which look like refrigerators here. Maybe you can show that as well, Judy. So we're growing viruses here and bacteria here and all the various equipment that we use for running gels, which is the end stage for PCR. We run gels here and we visualize our gels. Could you, maybe can you help me here? Let's see, let's look for a good gel. Where's it? Yeah. Here, Behringer. Yeah. Oh, it looks like a good gel. Yeah. Maybe, let's see here. So Tom, we've got a couple of questions for you. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. We can definitely take some questions and then you can even show really quickly, show a gel. So that's the end stage of the PCR that tells if, if, if a sample is positive or negative and all those little white bands are saying, yes, yes, I'm very, very positive for whatever pathogen, whether it be COVID-19. This is actually a lobster virus. So yeah, let's take a question. Yeah, okay. So one of the first questions is, and this is from me, how often is it necessary to relearn technology in order to stay up to speed? I'm looking at the way you were just looking at that gel from running a gel electrophoresis, and it's certainly very different and digitized from the right way I did it way back when I was in grad school. So um, talk to us about just keeping up with technology. Yeah, it, it, it's actually amazingly challenging, and you feel like a fossil uh, about every five years. And I've felt like a fossil. And I think I told you, Stephanie, the work I did for my PhD some 20-ish years ago could be done in, a, in less than a week now. And so it, it, to say it's revolutionized science and what we do and how we approach it is an understatement. Literally all of the sequencing that I did of the, the fish that I studied would have been done on a next generation sequencer, you know, in my own lab alone within a week. And so I think that proves to us how much things have changed. So honestly, technologies are moving so quickly, we, we, you know, you, you have to keep up with it on an annual basis. And there's lots of CE workshops for doing things like that and great technology workshops. Everything's online. There's a lot of Zoom meetings. So that's the way that you do it. But it, it absolutely requires staying, you know, going to meetings doing these, these workshops, staying on top of the literature, and, because everything is revolutionized. It's just incredible. as an example, yeah, just really, this one really quick thing. Um, we just sequenced yesterday the full genome of a Vibrio cholera. So you may, you know, you, you may know the disease cholera that causes yeah. diarrhea. It's one of the major pathogens in the world. Well, this is coming out of fish. And it's a slightly different strain, and thank God it's, it's not one of the diarrhea, diarrhea bacteria coming out of our fish, but, but it's a problem for the fish. We were able to do that in less than a week, and it's just extremely exciting to be able to get the full genome and actually know exactly what it is and what its closest relative is and report that to a farmer immediately. Something like that would have been a year, 10 years ago. Okay. Wow. So. That's great. Okay, so there, there's a couple people that are asking about PP, uh, PPE use in reference to the hood work that you do, um, the robots and what have you. How, what is the PPE that you're using within there with all these viruses? Yeah, so uh, the, the lucky thing is, is, so my lab is the Wildlife and Aquatic Veterinary Disease Lab. So we actually, when you think about biosecurity and the health of the people that you might be, that it might be working for you, we actually have EHNS and we have, of course, IACUC and all the different agencies that keep us safe and make sure the things that we're working with are safe. Luckily, most of what we work on are cold-blooded animals, fish, amphibians, and reptiles. Very few pathogens are actually transferable between those species and humans. Now, when it comes to COVID, we, we actually, although we sequence it, we do not handle human samples because we're the wildlife and aquatic veterinary disease lab. So we have a lot of fewer regulations than a laboratory that's handling human samples. And there's a way higher risk of handling human samples. That having been said, we just mentioned that we do work on marine mammals, they're warm blooded. 
And so we have some concern. And again, I, I said to you, the new diseases in humans will come from wildlife. We know that. We've been seeing that for the last 10 years plus. So what we actually have is people will actually wear a, a, um, a lab coat. But there's a face shield that you can see actually right here and a lab coat for anyone that would be handling the gel, which actually has toxic chemicals with it, and the face shield. And they would be working with gloves and they would be working in a biosafety cabinet and a room with negative pressure. But again, EHS makes sure our, our, our health and safety group here make sure they know what samples we are approved to handle. In other words, no human samples do we handle here. And we are not approved to work with a lot of mammal species, although we do work with birds. And there's plenty of, of zoonotic pathogens or pathogens that transmit from wildlife animals sure. to humans, birds. So we're approved to work with the species that we do. We follow the proper biosecurity plan for the species that we work on by working in hoods, by wearing gloves, by having negative pressure, by wearing a face shield when necessary, and so on and so on. If you're working on a fish, there's almost nothing that's of concern. If you're working on a bird, you may add a face shield to that. You may actually wear longer gloves and absolutely wearing a, a, uh, a, a coat and everything else and working within a, a biosafety cabinet. So. Well, there you go. That, that answers Chris's question. He was asking about test subjects that are, are, are samples that are human. So we know the answer to that now. Uh, Angela's got a question yeah. in reference to researchers uh, sending you samples. Do those happen just within the state of Florida? Are they from all over the world? How does that work? Yeah, yeah I, uh, <laughs> we like to think we're a, a leading research group internationally when it comes to aquatic animal pathogens and wildlife pathogens. So we do receive samples quite a bit internationally all over the world. The, the lab group is a very international group. So Kudi's actually, he's Indian, but he's from Malaysia. We have researchers from Brazil, all over Europe, all over Asia, Australia. And, and so it's a very international group. And the, the samples that we receive are international as well. So um, yeah, we receive samples all the time from around the country and also around the world. We, because we have robots and we have rapid turnaround with next generation sequencing technologies. So we have everything from the old school PCR, as we've shown you in the gel, to next generation sequencing technologies. So because of that and our rapid turnaround time, we do receive samples from around the world, which is, makes it always fun and exciting and so on and so on. Definitely, off. definitely. So um, regarding the pathway that led you to where you are, it seems such a specialty niche. How did you get to be in this room you're in? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I've had a bit of a random walk, perhaps, although I think I've always had a strong foundation in aquatic, an interest in aquatic animals and wildlife. And so um, my biology degree was in basically in marine biology, so that fits. And then I did an ichthyology degree, a master's degree, and from there I met my wife who was going to vet school. And it was then that right about that time, it was probably fortuitous that at that time, aquatic animal health was coming, uh, becoming a thing in veterinary medicine. And so I, you know, had lots of experience with aquatics, so I always thought about going to veterinary school, so I went to veterinary school and I did a joint veterinary degree and a PhD studying aquatic animals. So I, I am a specialist within veterinary medicine and focusing on wildlife and aquatic animal species. But I've had an interest in fish since I was a child. This allows me to travel the state of Florida and see aquaculture facilities all over the, the state as well as the country and the world. And so it's been a wonderful career. I think for our teachers, that's such a huge um, thing to, to hear and see because students in general have very little knowledge about all of the different facets and minutia of different broader fields of science. And especially when you're trying to kind of hook a student who maybe isn't as engaged in the scientific topic, if they maybe have an interest in fish, this would be one of those careers that perhaps would be really passionate and, and interesting for them to know about because of their passion with fish. So I think that's really interesting to hear. We've got a question from Angela. She wants to know, what's the most interesting pathogen you work on? <laughs> that's an impossible question. Oh God, I try to think, you know, it's a really tough question because we, we, we get excited about all the things we do. I think, you know, um, wow, how would I answer that question? I think it's, it's shocking to me when you think about something like Vibrio cholera, never would have thought I saw that killing fish. 
and then being able to immediately understand, this is a result from just today, so it's fresh in my yeah. mind, to think that you know we can now discriminate the strain from the human strain and we can tell the aquaculture industry, yes, it's killing fish, but it is not going to kill your staff, right? And that's a huge thing. I couldn't have done that before. We would have all been freaking out, telling them immediately that everybody needs to stop touching the fish. We need to do biosecurity. We need to figure out what's going on. That's really powerful and exciting. So finding a Vibrio cholera in fish is exciting. I guess the other thing that we've discovered, uh, we, 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 we literally publish you know, 20 plus papers a year and we sequence hundreds of new pathogens, bacteria, fungi, and viruses each year. So it, it's hard to pick one, but as far as viruses go, we've always been told viruses are non-living things and they're very simple. But what we know now is that some of the viruses that we see in fish are actually have genomes, their DNA, their backbone is larger than some bacteria. Hmm. So vir it's, the, it's the age of viruses. You know about COVID-19, it is the age of viruses. Viruses are now classified as living things. They are actually more complex than some bacteria and everybody considers bacteria a living thing. So we're literally reclassifying the, the, the status of a major group of pathogens, viruses, and that's all the result of next generation sequencing technologies. So we're kind of on the leading edge of a lot of fun, exciting stuff, or so we think we are, and we have a lot of fun and we enjoy it. I could talk your ear off about pathogens though, so I'll, I'll leave it at those two, the Vibrio and the giant viruses that we call mini viruses in fish that are even more complex than some bacteria. That's so interesting about the viruses being now reclassified too. That's news to me. So, so interesting to hear. Regarding the aquaculture industry and, and like the uh, folks that are farming fish for consumption, uh, are there more pathogens that we see in that world versus the wild or is it a toss up? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really challenging to keep up with Florida because there's a lot of states where the number of species in, you know, fin fish that are being reared are, is very small. Just a few, perhaps, a largemouth bass or something like that industry. But here in Florida, what keeps it exciting for us is the thousands of species that we raise, whether or not it be aquatic plants, whether or not it be freshwater fish, marine fish, fish raised for your pond or your home aquarium, fish raised for the table, fish raised for sports fisheries like largemouth bass. And so, you know, largemouth bass to be restocked to the wild to answer your question about what. And so, you know, there's quite a few uh, species that we actually have to deal with. That makes the number of pathogens increase immensely. And so it's really the number of species that we handle, they're all going to be carrying different viruses, bacteria, fungi, and so on, and parasites, and so on, and so on. So the sheer number of species and the sheer number of pathogens that they have is what makes it really exciting and uh, uh, always something new around the lab, like like finding a Vibrio this morning and sequencing its genome within a, just a few days. So, you know, the aquaculture industry, and to answer another one of your questions, what it deals with is high densities, lots of animals in a small place. And if you think about what we know about COVID, what are they telling you? Socially <laughs> distance. Wear a mask and socially distance, right? And so how do you social distance when you're actually right on top of each other? So in other words, what we call epidemiology, the spread of disease, it's a problem when you have high densities. And so we deal with infectious disease outbreaks all the time on the farm, so to speak. But that's our job, is to help our industries and come up with solutions to their problems. We deal with the same thing on wildlife populations when we have hundreds of manatees stranding or hundreds of dolphins stranding. We're right there on site. And as I mentioned, the really exciting thing, Cootie's holding the camera, but Cootie's the guy looking at those millions and millions of little sequences to try to figure out what viruses are happening. Maybe even doing that technology on the beach right next to the animal, which is just, to me, that's just, you know, I never thought we'd ever be there. So, and it goes back and enforces your point about having to keep up with technology on an annual basis. I mean, we always feel behind because somebody's doing something unbelievably new that we want to actually emulate and try to try to bring to the industries here in Florida. Yeah, there's two things that come to mind with what you just said. Number one, job security. <laughs> You've got lots to do. 
Uh, and, and the fact that you can take these new technologies and be running PCR sequencing or, or something like that right there in the field is amazing on a boat or on a beach. Yeah. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is with um, these kids and, and these great careers and opportunities that they can have. I can almost see in a classroom a project about aquaculture and this idea of social distancing. How can we redesign some of these farms and things that will help prevent disease or spread of disease, the epidemiology of the disease? It's fascinating yeah. to talk about this. Yeah. Benita has a question for you all. She wants to uh, know, once you identify the pathogen, what role does your lab play in helping to stop the spread of the pathogen in the aquatic po population? Is it just right. an, like an, you give advice or how yeah. does that work? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. Uh, the role that we play in stopping pathogens and helping is the first step, of course, is to make the diagnosis. And that can be challenging because usually a, a dying animal is not dying from one thing, it's dying from multiple things. So. The first step is to make a diagnosis and to evaluate as a clinician, I'm a veterinarian, what is really actually causing that disease in those animals. So that's step one. The exciting thing is with sequencing technologies and with the advent of rapid turnaround diagnostic tests, we can actually, we can develop a disease a diagnostic for a disease, maybe a new pathogen like a Vibrio, and get that on site to the farmer as soon as possible. So that in future years, when they have the same disease happening, which they always do, if they see it once, they're going to see it annually or every few years, we can give them on-site point of care is what we call on-site point of care diagnostics that allow them to rapidly work with a health professional or perhaps even themselves, if they feel comfortable, make some of those diagnoses. So making a diagnosis is the first step. We then actually, because we have the genome of the virus or the bacteria and we grow it in the lab, we showed you a little bit of growing it in the lab as well, we can actually make vaccines. So we work on the diagnosis side, we work on making sure that we can immediately make a fast diagnosis before it spreads, say, to all the ponds on, that a farmer may have. So that's very important, get them the, get them the results soon. And then if it's going to be a problem that they, that's recurrent, in the aquaculture industry, we're gonna be moving to the level of vaccines. And so we do grow viruses and develop vaccines and bacteria, uh, bacterial and viral vaccines and such. So we're working on a tilapia lake virus right now, which is a globally emerging problem in tilapia, which is the number two food fish in the world now. And it's a big, big problem. So we've got grants actually to develop a vaccine for that virus. So. That's a little bit about the things that we do, but we absolutely share that knowledge immediately with the farmer, go onto the, the site, maybe actually help cull groups, kill groups, humanely euthanize fish that, that are sick and, and stop the spread of the, the disease on the farm. And perhaps, you know, add antibiotics as needed. I'm a veterinarian, so I can prescribe antibiotics uh, to the farmer to help them with a, say, bacterial problem. Fascinating stuff. Is there any other questions? Are there any other questions out there uh, from our audience for Tom Rakuti? And if not, Tom, I wanted to ask you guys, uh, just to give us a takeaway, something that you would share to students in the K-12 world, um, maybe some words of inspiration or things that teachers can do to help bring awareness to some of these great applications of science, and certainly not the traditional vet uh, that we think of when we think of a veterinarian. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, with my, the, the random, I think that, that, that the, the truth of what I've seen in the 50 or 60 uh, uh, people that I've trained from undergraduates to graduate students, to veterinarians, to um, postdocs, to research scholars. So I've had a, an opportunity to see quite a few folks and I've been in this for a long, a long time to just to remember that all of the, the, the things that we do uh, culminate in, 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 in who we are. And that that walk can be a random walk. I see that all the time. And each of those things contribute to the, to the, the, the knowledge base that I have. And to remember that a lot of fields, I could, be a, I could be called a marine biologist. I probably have the degrees to be able to say that. I could be called a pathologist. I could be called a, just a veterinarian, but I'm often known as a fish health specialist. So that means the veterinary degree, which is what I really define myself as an aquatic animal veterinarian, look at all the different things that I can do with that. I can work in diagnostics. I could work with fish and wildlife, you know, state agencies, national agencies. I can work in a research lab at a university setting. I get to travel the world. 
And so it's a very exciting field to be a part of. And that you could, of course, be talking about this completely terrestrial. So there'll be a lot of people that want to study the, the large megafauna. So lions and bears and such. And I have my, my colleagues that do that as well. We're just the aquatics realm. But it allows me to be a marine biologist and it allows me to be interested in veterinary medicine and provide a, a, a productive role uh, to the community through making sure our fish are, are you know, uh, we have fish to be able to eat, our wildlife populations are safe and so on and so on. And, uh, and, and really to keep up with technology and make changes that we couldn't have even dreamed of before. So I would say that the, as a take home, many different things, but the one thing I would say is the veterinary field is, uh, allows you to do oh so many things, whether or not it be research, diagnostic, or travel. Yeah, absolutely. I, thank you so much for spending time with us today.